Ladies and gentlemen, unless you've been living under a rock, you already know that the Buzzy Bees update for Minecraft is out. That also comes with update videos from me, but this one has been delayed. If you follow the channel closely, you'll know that I was busy and then had an accident keeping me away from computers for a while. But here we are, we are going to go through all the technical changes in this version in this video. Do note that this relates to Minecraft 1.15 only. There are separate update videos for Minecraft 1.15.1 and 1.15.2 and those include the technical changes of those versions. Also, if you want the full update video for all the gameplay changes, there is a link to that on the video right now on a card and in the video description. This video is going to take you through all of the technical behind the scenes changes for this version including game rules, commands, text components, loot tables, new entities and other resources, as well as changes to the formats for resource packs and data packs. So let's get into that starting with game rules. There are a whole bunch of new game rules in this version. They're all brought over from Bedrock Edition which had these for a while. Let's start with the Do Insomnia game rule. The default for that is true and if you switch it off then it will prevent phantoms from spawning during nighttime. Do immediate respawn is a game rule that is defaulted to false. If you switch that on, then you will not see the death screen anymore. You will just simply instantly respawn. There are three new game rules related to how you take damage. They are drowning damage, fall damage, and fire damage. They all default to true, and if you turn them off, then players will stop taking that particular type of damage. Drowning damage, of course, is only for drowning. Fall damage is from falls and fire damage is from anything related to fire, like being on fire, being in fire, being on a magma block, or being in lava. Let's move on to two changes in commands. There's a new command in this version called spectate. Syntax for this is spectate with a target and then a player. If you don't give a player, then it applies to yourself, whoever's running the command, and if you don't give a target, then it will make you stop spectating instead of starting to spectate. The effect is exactly as if you clicked on somebody while in spectator mode, and it only works if you are already in spectator mode. There's a new folder that you can put custom predicates in in data packs. The folder name is predicates, and the predicate there matches what you would normally put in a loot table. Why am I saying this in context of commands? Well, because you can now do execute if predicate, and that refers to one of those predicates, so you can check even if a predicate is true, and only in that case keep running the command. There's a new selector argument for that as well, it is predicate equals, that lets you select only entities or players with that predicate being true. More execute changes and fixes. Anchoring didn't reset after one use, which meant that if you used local coordinates several times in a row, like in a recursive function call or just several times in the same command, you would get the offset between feet and eyes several times over. That has been fixed in this version. By abusing execute store, you could modify player data inside of an item tag inside of their inventory. That has been fixed in this version. The schedule command has been extended. You can now do schedule with whatever the function name you want to schedule. And now there's a new optional parameter that is append or replace. The default is replace, which works exactly like it used to. But if you do append, you can now schedule more than one function invocations at once. You can also do schedule clear, which removes any existing schedules for that function. The result of running schedule clear with a function ID is the number of removed schedules. A number of selector parameters now default to at s if you don't specify them. That goes for slash kill and slash effect clear. There are also some changes to command blocks. If you had a powered command block and you changed it to repeat mode, then it wouldn't start triggering until you took away the power and put it back. That has been fixed in this version. Command blocks with trailing spaces didn't show an error message, but when you tried to run them, you would still error out. That has been fixed in this version. And command input now shows more error information when you type in chat. There's some changes to NBT data as well. Item entity merging would completely ignore the owner tag of the item entity that has been fixed in this version. And that owner field locks in who can pick the item up, except if there was less than 10 seconds left before the item would despawn, at which point that functionality stopped working. That has been fixed in this version. Let's talk about storage. Data commands like execute store and data can now use storage as a target. The storage is a general purpose key value storage where you can store anything you want. It is shared between all dimensions in a world. 
and whatever you store in there will persist between the reloads. Like I said, you can access this from using slash data, from using slash execute store, and you can also access it from loot tables. Storages are specified with a resource ID, that means a namespace and a name. Let's talk about text components, because text components also have access to storage now. There's a variant for NBT components that can now access storage by specifying the storage key and putting the value to the resource ID that you want to access. You also specify the path just like you would for entity data, for instance. There's a new click event action too, it's called copy to clipboard. And what it does should be fairly self-evident. Let's talk about loot tables as well. There are a bunch of new things here. There's a new function called copy state. And that will copy the state parameters from a block to a block state tag in an item that has parameters block, which is the source of the properties that you want to get. That is a block ID and the properties, which is a list of property names. All of the properties that you specify have to be present on the block for this to work. This also only works in block loot tables. The enchantments field now only matches the enchantments on the items itself. You can no longer use that for enchanted books. You can still match enchanted books if you want to do that. You need to use a new field called stored enchantments instead. Like I mentioned before, loot table predicates can be defined in separate files now. And there's a new condition to look up externally defined predicates called reference. Entity predicates now accept a player field which checks player properties and it fails when the entity is not a player. The properties that you can check are level for a range of allowed player levels, game mode, taking the same values as the slash game mode command, stats that carries a list of statistics to match, and the entry fields for this are type, for example, Minecraft colon custom, stat, like Minecraft colon sneak underscore time, and the value, which is an integer range. You can also match your property recipes, which is a map of recipe IDs to boolean values. And for each recipe ID, you specify whether that recipe should or should not be unlocked by the player for the match to succeed. Advancements goes the same way for advancement IDs. If the value is a boolean, then it will check if the advancement is done. Otherwise, you can specify an object which checks the completions of individual criterions within that advancement. The entity predicate now also accepts a team field which matches the team name. Location predicate also accepts block and fluid sub predicates and the available fields here are block or fluid for matching an exact ID. Tag for matching a block or fluid tag. NBT for matching block entity NBT and that only works for blocks not for fluids. State which is a map of name to value properties. So the value can be an integer boolean or string or an object with min and max properties. You can also match a light sub predicate and the object there has an integer range called light that matches the visible light, which is the maximum of the visible light from the sky and the block light. The location check also has new parameters offset X, offset Y and offset C to offset to a different block location to test. There's a new condition as well, it's called the time underscore check. For this you can specify value, which is a range of accepted values and period. And if that is present, the time will be checked against the remainder of a division with this period. That means that if you set it to 24,000, which is the number of ticks in a day, then you will check that time of day, for instance. Let's talk about advancements. There are three new triggers in this version. One is to be nest destroyed which is a very specialized trigger that triggers when a player breaks a bee nest or beehive. The available conditions for this are the block, which is the block that was destroyed, except the block ID, item, which is the item used to break the block, this works like any other item condition in the game, and num underscore bees underscore inside, that represents the number of bees inside the hive before it was broken. The second trigger added is safely harvest honey, that triggers when the player harvests honey from a bee nest or beehive with a campfire below it, also a very specialized trigger. It has the available conditions for block, which accepts a block ID or a tag, and the item, which is the item the player used to harvest the honey. And the third and final new trigger is slide down a block, which triggers when the player slides down a block. And the conditions for this are the block that the player slid on. Currently, this is only interesting in the case of a honey block. 
Let's talk about added things in this version. There is one new entity, it is called the bee. There are new blocks as well, of course, bee nest, beehive, honey block and honeycomb block. And the bee nest and beehive are a little more interesting. They both share the same block entity data and that has a bees field and that contains entities that are inside and will eventually spawn. You'll have to experiment to find out the limits of that. There are new particle types, dripping honey, falling honey, falling nectar and landing honey, as well as new items, honey bottle and honeycomb. Let's round off talking about packs. Both for resource and data packs, the version is now number five. For data packs, this really doesn't matter. You can just upgrade your version to version five and everything will work as before. For resource packs, there are more changes. A whole bunch of textures have changed and the game will try to make out of date resource packs work when you load them, but is far from perfect. Now, as to what the changes and additions are inside of resource packs, let's go through those. If you need to upgrade a resource pack, there's a bit of work to do for this version. Banners and shields now have a base texture and then use the alpha value of textures of layers on top of those to compose the textures. That means that you need to convert your top layers to use alpha values to specify which pixels should go on and not. Chest textures have been shuffled around, it's a little hard to explain and if you have a Linux or Sigwin or something like that environment and you have the image magic tool installed, then there's a little shell script that you can run to update all of your textures. If not, I've put together a sequence of manual image operations that you can do in a program like Photoshop or GIMP or Paint.net. In addition to that, after that whole work has been done, the double chest textures have been split into a left and a right half. Somebody also made a Minecraft resource pack converter tool. I'll link you a Planet Minecraft page for that down in the video description. Caveat here is I have not tried this myself, but if you don't want the hassle of upgrading yourself, then that might be worth a shot. The Colonnade Wind animation now has an MC Meta animation file, just like all of the other things. The Ender Dragon texture used to have a duplicate wing. That section of the texture is unused now. There's a new folder called Iron Golem. The base texture for the Iron Golem has moved in there and there are new textures for the cracking overlays. So you can modify those if you want. There's a new map background checkerboard file in the map folder and that represents the empty map background when you hold a map in your hand and there are areas of that map that have not been filled. And finally, the enchantment glint texture is now a composite. It used to be rendered once straight up and then once sideways at an angle and the texture has now been changed to be that instead. So essentially the texture looks exactly like how it looks in game instead of being a composite overlay of two different things. Hopefully that will help you upgrade your packs a bit. One final tech related change that I do have to mention that's not strictly related to the game itself but it is related to tech surrounding the game. The obfuscation mappings of the game are now public. You can find them in the manifest, in the launcher manifest. That means that if you are interested in what function names were before obfuscation you can now go and apply those mappings to find out. This generally will be mostly interesting for modders or mod pack makers or people digging into the code trying to understand what it does for some reason. And that's all I had for you this time. I hope you found that quick overview useful and if you want some more specific in-depth tutorial of something please let me know in the comments down below and I'll try my best to accommodate. Anyway, thank you for watching. My name is Sliced Lime, and I'll see you in another video. Take care. Bye bye.